Welcome, everybody. This is week seven of our Alice workshops. Uh, if you are just joining us now, there are others up on YouTube that precede this that might be helpful for you to watch in preparation for what we're going to cover today. Today, we are going to cover introduction to events. Uh, as part of introduction to events, we're going to jump out and do a little bit uh, to cover some other lessons that are just helpful for doing introduction to events. This includes uh, using functions and relational expressions and also a quick recap of some of what we covered last week in conditionals for uh, control structures, so if else's and things like that. Uh, we will then wrap up with a tutorial that goes along with introduction to events. And so hopefully by the end of today, you will be able to create some interactive worlds. I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing now. And we will get to it. Once again, I apologize for background noise. All right. So if we are on alice.org and we are in the Alice 3 lessons section, we are going to be covering today this introduction to events first. Because uh, using events relies heavily on some control structures conditionals, we'll cover this one as well. Just pointing out the other lessons that are here and how they intermix. Um, conditionals rely heavily on using relational ex relation relational expressions as well as uh, built-in functions. So I'm gonna jump into those as well and then we'll wrap up with a tutorial. All right, so let's do the introduction to events and I will start here. So interactivity in programming means that the order of the program outcome is not predetermined when we press play. So we've done a bunch of things where the do togethers, do in orders are just sequential programming um, even using a count loop, it's really going to do the same thing. The first place that we really got into some of this was in the while loop, where if something were to change, then it could possibly execute differently. But even then, if we haven't included something that allows for some randomization or some user input, it will still process the same. So in Alice, there are events. So an event is something that happens. In our world, because just the construction of Alice and what we've opened up for you, we use event listeners to then have the computer listen for these inputs. Uh, we have in Alice scene activation time, keyboard, mouse, and position orientation, uh, these basic four buckets. So the scene activation time one is really the time being, well, we'll come back to this one, or things related to when the program starts or time passing in the world. Keyboard is pretty straightforward and this is if the user were to press something on the keyboard. Mouse is obviously if you do mouse clicks or rollers, things like that. And then position and orientation because Alice is in 3D and has a virtual world, this is sort of the relationship of objects to each other can also have uh, resulting events. In the code editor that we've covered a bunch, there is the tab that is the initialize event listener. So from Mostly up till now, we've been in the my first method or created our own custom procedure tabs. In this case, we're gonna be talking about this tab that we haven't touched on yet. And so the first thing you would need to do is just make sure you're on that one. You'll see it functions a little bit differently. Um, the other way is just the construction of listeners and handlers. So the event listener is the part that says, we want the computer or the program to listen for these things. Sometimes it might be coming from within Alice, sometimes it might be coming from outside of Alice. So if you think about the keyboard one is, if we didn't have our program listening to the keyboard, then you know we would be pressing all kinds of keys and nothing would happen because our program isn't actually paying attention for those things. So first you set up your program to listen for them. Um, that is what you do in that initialize event listeners and then you want those outcomes from those events to then do something. So we call that the event handler. Uh, we have covered in previous uh, lessons and workshops on this one, uh, how to create custom procedures. So a great way to do it and keep your code clean is that in this little example here, you see that the event listener is that we want a mouse click to have this thing happen. We have then created a scene procedure called the wave where we put the code for what happens when that mouse click happens. Um, if you and your following didn't really grasp the custom procedures in creating that or in your class, you're not covering that just due to time or whatever, you can put the code inside that mouse clicked event. 
So all of that code for the wave could be in there. Uh, but really a, a, something that we promote is that you sort of write that code so that it has the sort of level of abstraction and those custom procedures to help you organize your program. Um, in that case, you know, the wave would be a separate procedure that calls in there. Then when you're looking at your events, it's sort of cleaner to look at. You're not seeing your whole program written inside of those. Again, both of them will function. So if you haven't covered how to create your own custom procedures, you can write the code inside there. All right, so a little deeper in our event types, we have the scene activation listener. So pretty much this one is just when your program starts, which is the scene activated, whatever would go in there would happen. So an example of that is you see when you go to the initialize event listeners, there's already one in there, and that one is an add scene activation listener, and it calls my first method. So that essentially is why when I press the play button, the code that I wrote in my first method actually runs. If you were to delete away that uh, scene activated listener or take out the my first method, your program wouldn't run at least the, the code in my first method wouldn't run. So if something goes weird in your program, maybe check that you didn't accidentally delete this one. The next one is the time listener. And so this one is based on using the internal clock of the computer. A lot of programs do this. And essentially it's just saying when a second passes or two seconds. So when you add this one, you can set the intervals that you wanted to check something. This is just a really good way um, to continuously check back to see if things have changed in your world. And again, it uses the, the internal clock of the computer. The next ones are our keyboard events. Uh, we have broken it down into arrow key presses, a general key press, number of key presses, and then we have this uh, default add object move for that we'll talk about a little bit. Um, all of these are just, if you were to use one of those, anything that fits that statement would work. We're gonna talk a little bit more about how you would want to break that down and make it more specific for an individual key or things like that. Mouse events, this one has the mouse click on object listener and a mouse click on screen. So obviously it's just any click would be a click on the screen. If you want to then set it so that it's a specific object in your world, that one would then go under the mouse click on object listener. And then we have a add default model manipulation. Uh, again, I'm gonna go a little bit more into detail of that one in a second. Pause for a second due to the noise. Position orientation, so as I said, another thing that can happen in Alice, not listening to events outside of the program, so inputs from the user via uh, input devices, is this set, which is position and orientation events. So a lot of it is just, we have these 3D worlds and a bunch of things that go, um, say you're moving an object around or some other part of your code then does that. Um, it would just then be, let me pause for a moment for some noise. Sorry, just a brief pause. All right, I think, we've got, I think we've got some quiet again. All right, so those position ones include things like the collision start, collision end. So if two objects were to run into each other, uh, proximity start and end, um, view enter. So is it in view of the camera? Occlusion means one object is blocking another object. And then point of view is really just did the orientation of that object change. So this is a lot of the ones that you use for sort of games where you would run into things to collect them or interact with them and those types of things. So how do we create an event? First, we go to that tab. So again, you want to be on the initialize event listeners. Um, we've talked about the default one that is already there. We add an event listener. So this one cascades down. So first you would hit the button that says add event listener. In this example, we would choose mouse and then add mouse click on screen. Create that event handler. So if you are following the one that says that we want to have separate code that is specifically a custom procedure for the handler for that event, 
then we would sort of write that wherever else we would want it to do to separate the listener that is listening for the mouse click and the code that will be run, which would be the custom procedure. Once you create that mouse click event, it's gonna look a lot like the control structure um, blocks that we talked about last week. So there will be a blank spot. You see again that the default in any of these is gonna be the do an order construct. And then in this case, we're dragging the hop into the mouse clicked event. So now we have the event listener for the mouse click and we have the handler for the hop and we're dragging that into the code. Again, if you haven't covered custom, making custom procedures, you could just write the code for the hop. So, you know, rabbit move up down inside that listener. Modifying an event listener. So this is where I, after this one, we'll talk a little bit about functions, but when we were talking about the types of procedures we had before, there was the purple, which were the procedures, and the green, which were the functions that return a specific piece of data. So in a lot of these event listeners, you'll see the little bit of green, event is letter, event is digit, those types of things. Those are built-in functions that we can add to something in order to modify it. And so in the example shown here, the key press, uh, again, we'll talk a little bit about the if-else conditional again, extending what we talked about last week. Uh, we can set up something where it says, I don't want it to just be any key press, I want it to be a space bar. So in that case, we use the if the event is the key space bar is true, then we'll do the hop. So the difference being that uh, it then won't do it for any key press. We also have add details. So much like the parameters in our other procedures, uh, different event listeners will have different parameters. And so in this case, the mouse click has a set of visuals, the multiple event policy and the held key policy. So the set of visuals is really a, a fancy way of saying that I only wanna pay attention to this set of objects. So since this one is a mouse click on object listener, I can use the set of visuals to create an array of objects so that it, the mouse click will only trigger if those things are selected. Multiple event policy, uh, this would just be, if I click multiple times on it, do I want it to queue those things? Do I want it to combine those inputs? Do I want it to ignore multiple ones? And then held key policy would be more relevant for a key press that says, if I hold down this space bar or arrow key, do I want it to keep triggering over and over again? Um, or do I want it to only trigger when I press release and things like that? So you have a couple of different options there. Here is just walking through the use of the listener functions that I was talking about. So in this case, we have the mouse click and it says hop. Um, in this case, we've set it up to be which character. So we can get the model at mouse location. So when I click on it, one of our built-in functions for the mouse click is to actually have the computer ask, what did I just click on? So that would be the get model mouse at location. We've created a parameter using that. So again, if you, have, if you haven't covered parameters in your class, um, don't worry about that one now. And you could use this inside code written in that listener. Uh, but in this case, we've passed it as a parameter into our hop. So then it just says, if the mouse, the, the model clicked on in that location was the hair, then we'll have the hair do it. If it was the troll, we'll have the troll do it. And so we're showing how we've sort of created different conditional outcomes depending on which uh, model was actually clicked. Built-in event handlers. So these are some unique ones that we created where, again, the benefit of abstraction is that you don't necessarily need to know what went into constructing something in order to have it actually be usable by somebody. This is another one of our built-in procedures where we've made a construct that you could build yourself, but we've made a simpler one so that you can dive right into building interactive worlds in Alice. So the keyboard one that is the add object move for, and then essentially you decide which object in your world you want to connect, or uh, sorry, control. What is really happening underneath that is we've created an arrow key press listener that puts the up arrow key or the W key to move forward one space over one second, the down arrow key to move backward one over one second, the left arrow key to turn left and the right arrow key to turn right. So this is just a really easy one to drag and drop to be able to make controllable worlds in Alice. And so we call it that, you could build it yourself and you may want to in the future for more flexibility. But at the end of the day, that's sort of the functionality of that one. We have another one that is called add default model manipulation. This is a mouse, under the mouse click one. 
So this allows you to click on an object and drag it around the screen. Um, previously, we had called this one the World Destroyer just because we didn't have a parameter on it allowing you to limit the objects. So essentially, if you turn this on, any object that was clicked, you could drag around the world. Uh, we have just recently, so in our newest beta, and then depending on your watching this video, uh, if you grab the newest version of Alice, there will be a parameter on this that allows you to do that set of visuals much like you could on a mouse click on an object listener or things like that. So you could limit the objects that you could drag around. Uh, we are also playing around with different ways to manipulate what you want that default drag behavior to be in terms of does it go up and down, left, right, those types of things. So a couple of tips and tricks. Once we start using these, things that you're gonna to wanna to build in Alice are you know, worlds that you run around in. Obviously that's one of the big ones in Alice is you created this 3D world, so you want you or a character to move around in it. Um, if you are a game player or even some animations will use this, you know, a first person camera is the one where I am sort of the camera and I move around and it is through my lens. That is the way where you would just sort of add that object move for on the camera. And then you know, when I move using the arrows, I'm changing my viewpoint. Uh, a third person camera means that the camera is looking at the object and sort of following it around. So in this example that you're seeing here, imagine that we've taken the camera and we are following the pickup truck around. And so in this case, you, know, you wanna drive the pickup truck around and you want the camera to follow around it. We talked briefly about this in a previous one, but this is really where we get into vehicling. So if we're looking at this one, the top part of this image is the scene editor side. And on the property side on the right, you'll see that there is this property called vehicle. Anytime you would want the camera to follow around or let's say ride, the reason I chose the pickup truck for here is the best way to think about this is the vehicle is the object that is you know, carrying the other object. So if I am in the pickup truck bed as a vehicle, I can still move around inside the back of that bed and it doesn't affect the pickup truck, but if the pickup truck moves, I go with it. So if we take that vehicle and we set that vehicle to the pickup truck for the camera, you know, the camera is now in the pickup truck at whatever place that I have located it. And then if I do the add object move for the pickup truck, when I move the pickup truck around, the camera is gonna follow it. We're gonna get into doing a tutorial this may sound like a lot, but it is pretty straightforward when you go to do it. Since Alice is a visual programming language, when you get into creating some of these events, sometimes it becomes hard to know whether the handler part of your code is the part that is not working or your event is not working. So in lots of languages, you would have some debug screen or something where you could watch the program as it's executing to know if there's an error somewhere or if something isn't executing so you can kind of understand where you might be going wrong. Um, in Alice, since we are just all in this 3D world, a trick that we use a lot of times is to use just a say uh, procedure inside an event so that you know that it actually triggered or even in your handler code. So in this case, you're seeing the sports car is colliding with the anthill. And in the, the code we have written there, we just have the collision started and then it just says, sports car says collision. This way we know that that collision happened because the car is saying that the collision is happening. If I had more code that was dependent on that collision happening, let's say like damage to the car or points in a game or something like that, I at least know that this part of the code is set up right and triggering and then I can debug further down the line. You could then turn on and off that by enabling or disabling that code if you wanted to leave it in your final product um, and things like that. So that is the broad overview of all the different types of events we have and the general approach to how you construct them. Well, then I'm going to just go over some things that I just covered in there, but I want to go a little bit deeper just so that it sort of drives home what we were showing in there and just as a backstop to make sure that everybody understands the components of it before we jump into the tutorial. So one of our other lessons is this one called using functions. We'll see that we've got this ostrich and baby ostrich. I'm gonna jump into here and just present this one, just to be extra clear that everybody got this concept since it's something that's built into events. Again, maybe you don't really need to understand this one to use them, but it's always good. All right, so going back to the very beginning, intro programming in Alice, we talked about what is a method, and a method is a set of instructions that can do something. 
again, the purple one that we see here, jumping jack is the method. It has, you know, this object, jump up and down and move its arms. Um, purple and green. So on the left, we have the procedural methods. And so again, these for Alice are things to help you animate. So the move turns and rolls. Most of what we've been doing has been living in this space. If you have suddenly found yourself things not working, it means you may have accidentally hit this green functions tab, or maybe you covered this before because it is also very helpful for just basic animations. Um, in this example, it's gonna show that. The functional method is the one that returns data. So it could be about the environment, something about objects, something from the user. And in that one, you see things like getting the size of an object, uh, distance to, above, from, and then also one that is sort of another way to get to event inputs is the getting info from the user is another type of functional method that we have. So the function asks a question, so check a condition on the computer or a value, information from Alice being those, you know, is it colliding, distance from, those types of things. Information from outside of Alice could be data, time, things like that. Our built-in functions look like these ones, and then we just spoke about ones that are inside the event listeners and headers. So the class methods are gonna be similar to procedures and are gonna be unique depending on what object you have selected. So in this case, the ostrich is an object, so we can find out the width, height, depth. Um, the event listener headers are also going to be unique depending on the type of event that you're programming. So in this case, you see that the key pressed one has things that are unique to functions. We might care about asking the computer about a key press. So is it a letter? Is it a number? Uh, is it a specific key? And then obviously the mouse click ones are a little bit different because they're more related to a mouse. So we have things like how far from the left of the screen did we click, the right, and then if that kept going, there was the one is the what object was clicked. Information from inside Alice. So if you're just using this for things like animation, um, the types of things you might ask are what color is an object, how tall is an object, um, relational properties such as how far is the ostrich from the baby ostrich, uh, is the ostrich to the right of the ostrich. Um, I'll speak to this one a little bit more. In the example, this is a great example of having to using a function to make your life easier. So we want the baby ostrich to move over next to the adult ostrich. We could do something where we have the ostrich move left and we just keep putting in different values until we get it to where we think we want it to be. Or I can use the power of the computer to ask that information of how far it is. So if you see the program underneath that right now, it says the ostrich move left, get distance to the right of the ostrich, the baby ostrich. So essentially I just want it to move the, the full distance is away from it. Um, this would put the baby ostrich right on top of the ostrich. And so then we use a little bit of math to say, I want that distance, I want it to move that distance, but let's subtract one meter because I really want it to stand one meter to the right of it. Um, that allows you to move these things around and get the same results without having to change your code and find the distances and tweak it yourself. Information from users is another really useful one. So. In this one, you see the get boolean from user, get string from user, double from user, integer from user. The boolean is really just saying, ask the user true or false. String could be any text. Uh, the double and integer is then obviously a decimal number or a whole number. Um, so those are things that you can prompt the user to give you. And then in the bottom one, you see the example again of the rabbit or hare. And the function we're using is the what model was at the location that we just clicked. So that can be a really useful one and we'll get to that one in a little bit. All right, so using a function, it's just the same as any of the procedures. It is the drag and drop. So you pull them from the functions tab or if it's a built-in function. The one difference will be is that it's going to go inside of some other code. So it doesn't stand alone on its own, but it informs and so generally replaces a parameter of some other procedure. We do highlight where it can be replaced. So you'll see the little black box indicating that you know, this one can only be used uh, in this section that matches the data type. If you haven't covered what a data type is, uh, we have a small lesson on that, but it just means that I can replace a function that returns a direction if it is going to inform a direction. If it was going to be a distance, I would expect a number if I'm trying to replace 
a object, then it would probably be a character or another object. And we will constrain that. Um, and the program constrains that so that we don't end up with broken code. So here is what that looks like in the screen. Um, the rest of the screen will sort of be covered with a film showing you just where you can drag in that. So if the place that you think that you want to replace it doesn't actually have a box around it or look like it can be replaced, that's probably an indicator that you have two different types of data types. So you might need to think about how you're constructing it. So again, most of these will replace a parameter. So in this case, you see a, a number of different ones for, you know, if it is a distance, you see that the get distance to the left of um, is replacing the number in a move. If it is an ostrich say, I'm expecting a, a text string. So in that case, there is a function that is get string from user. So text will replace test, text. Uh, in the last example, we're using a count loop. And so again, we're using a function that is asking for a number from the user because we're replacing a number with a number. Um, again, these are also examples of using functions as ways to um, essentially pull data from the user. Conditional outcomes. This is another great one that says that a if condition will always be true unless there is something in there that can be different based on something. So a great way to have your program not run the same way over and over again is to set up these sort of if else conditionals that says like, if the model to location is this, then do this or do this other thing. And so those types of functions allow user input to change how your program uh, executes. Mathematical expressions is really just saying that the information inside of that is going to do something like a plus minus uh, some type of arithmetic division multiplication. So again, going back to our ostrich example, if I use the get distance to replace that distance like we talked about, the baby ostrich and the mama ostrich or dad ostrich or other ostrich will end up standing right on top of each other. If I add that little bit of arithmetic to say subtract one from that information that we come back, it will move that distance minus the one and end up just a little bit offset from it. Tips and tricks. If you're having a challenge trying to figure out what, why something can't be used where you think it can, that functions tab can be grouped by return types. So you can see, well, these are all the ones that are going to return a true or false. These ones will return a decimal number and a whole number. And so that can help you sort out why you may not be able to be doing the re uh, replacing. A great thing for Alice, both for animations and games, is using a random number function. So a random number function essentially asks the computer to just pick me a number inside this range. Uh, we will come back to this example over and over again, and a lot of games will build or interactive worlds and things like that. It looks like a function. You can find it underneath most objects and things like that and a lot of the drop downs for values. And so in this example, the ostrich is going to move a random integer from range one to 10. If I wanted to start setting up the world so that it just seems like there's some AI going on or something like that where the ostrich is not going to move the same way every single time I play the world or every time it loops through something, you can do something like that where you just change the distance and it will just sort of go through. The next one is an example of creating an array. So we in these workshops haven't gone into arrays, but there's a lesson on there that talks about arrays. You can create that as a variable and essentially say like, let's have three different things that the ostrich could say, and we want to use a random number generator to decide which of those that I want to have the ostrich say. This can, say that this can help you if you have something where somebody can interact with a character over and over again and you don't want them to sound like a robot and just say the same thing over and over again. You can add this random number generation to then choose um, from this array of, of text strings so that it will say something different and in different orders every time they play the game. Random numbers in a conditional can also help you make it so that we talked about making that ostrich move a random distance I could do something where I set up a turn left or right based on a random true or false. So when it comes to this code, it's gonna say, give me a true or false, uh, randomize it every time. 
if it is true, then I want the ostrich to turn to the right. If it is false, I want the ostrich to turn to the left. There's ways that you can set up a variable that does the random number so that you can check against it in a bunch of different conditionals. So there's a lots of different ways that you can use random numbers. And definitely if you're gonna go down the road of using random numbers, you can come to this functions lesson and it'll walk you through a little bit more of that and how to use them. Control structure and conditionals is something that we talked about in that introduction to events. We also talk about it again in the using functions just because it's a, a great way to, a function is a great way to an extend a conditional or change the outcomes. Uh, so we're gonna jump into this lesson. So what is a conditional expression? A conditional control structure is just one where it says, uh, it will do a different action depending on the evaluation of a condition, condition being either true or false. So it is if else, you can nest those into each other, but it is, if this is true, we will do this thing. If it is false, we will do this other thing this is used a lot in interactive and game programming uh, because you want things to change based on, you know, the health of a character, the number of points that you have, those types of things. If you are going to flow chart this and follow our sort of Alice design process of first designing uh, or first answering the question of what I'm trying to do, breaking that down and then to plan for your program, uh, starting to flow chart out. This is what an if else flowchart looks like. So we're coming through our program, we get to this condition. Is it true? Well, then I'm gonna go and do this thing. If it is false, I'm going to do this other thing and then continue on with the program. So conditionals and Alice, here's some examples of if the manatee is this far from the orca um, or less, then I'm going to have it swim away. So an example of using the condition of how far an object is from another object to decide whether it should swim away or just stay where it is. Uh, this is something that could change if the manatee is moving around. Uh, the other one was, we talked about a mouse click. So we only wanted to do this thing if I click on the hair, if I click on something else, I might have other code that is going to execute the next one would be is you know, here is a variable tied to a score or a timer. So if the game time equals zero, then we are going to end the game. So this is sort of using conditionals to manage game states of winning and losing or other things like that, progressing through levels. So those are a couple of examples of using location to determine if something should happen, using user input. So whether I click on it, press a key or something like that, and another one where you know, I am following states of the world where I've created some kind of variable to track score or time or something like that. So for an ex conditional expression to work, there has to be, you know, a true or false. So something can be true or something can be false is sort of the base of it. So if this is true, then do this else, it would be false and then I'm going to do this other thing. Um, if you don't set up something where that is going to change, then it will just keep doing the same one because it will always be true. Uh, the way that you can change this is you use a sort of binary expression, which would then be um, this thing can resolve to be true or false. In this case, we have the less than on the top, we have an equal to, or we have a Boolean variable that we can set and change based on other outcomes. If you don't set up some kind of this relational, expection, relational expression, then your conditional will always resolve to the same outcome. When we drop an if-else control block into your program, similar to all our other ones, we are going to force you to put some things in that you can change later so that you don't have broken code. This amounts to, you know, I drag the if control block from the bottom, so remembering in the code editor that if uh, the control structures are down in the bottom, drag the if in, um, the default is to set the you know, state of true or false. So is true is true will just always resolve to true. False means it will always resolve to the else. Um, again, here is sort of the breakdown of if this condition is true, then do this. Else it is false, then do this. Here's another example of using those sort of conditions and then putting in um, the key presses, so a lot of this is how you would construct your own uh, object move forward with key presses. 
So what you see over here is we have the orca. If the event is keyed up, then we would use the orca moves forward. So that is the only one that will resolve to true is that the key equals the up key. Else it will go into the next block. But we don't want it to just do something if I press a key that is not the up key. We want to then say that if the key is the down key, we want this other thing to happen. Well, if that is not true, we're going to go into the next block. So you can do a bunch of these things where you nest through and check the same uh, event against mul multiple possible conditions to figure out which one it should do. Conditionals with loops. So sometimes you want something to run through but you want it to keep going until something would change, right? So in this case, while the workout is active is true, we are going to keep going through and this uh, playing card is gonna keep doing these jumping jacks. Um, by putting that if conditional inside that while loop, if the camera is facing the playing card, it will keep happening. Otherwise, nothing will happen. So this is sort of the jumping jack, um, dodging working out when the camera isn't looking at it. So this is another way that all of these sort of control structures can be nested inside of each other to create different outcomes. To build it, you drag it in, choose the default. If you have any existing variables that will resolve to or um, functions you've created that will resolve to, they will show up in that list. The other way to change that default tree that you drag into is again to make use of functions like we just talked about. So getting a boolean from a user would be able to replace that the little carrot on the side of the default true that you drop in there will then allow you to come down and this is where you'll find those relational expressions so a relationship relational expression will resolve to a true or false so in this case you see the the decimal number one i can either choose less than less than equal to greater than greater than equal to equal 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 those types of things. So again, use for distances, those types of things, so that you know, it can be true or false, depending on some math. If I created variables elsewhere, and we'll revisit this when we get to, to using variables, they will show up at the bottom of the list if they match the data type. And then again, same as if it was sort of my first method or any of the do-togethers or do-in orders, You'll see the drop statement here in both of those possible outcomes. That function is the same as any other one. You can add code into that. You can add more code into that um, once you do the first one, but you'll see that is where you add code into a conditional block. Using nested blocks is the same as any of the do-togethers and do-in orders. For the conditional one, like the ORCA example we talked about, uh, you can have an if this is true, do this, else do this, and if you want multiple different types of outcomes to happen. You can nest those inside of it. This example makes uses of the function random number that we talked about to create a variable that is the random number. And so it just picks a number between zero and three. And then the first conditional says, if the number that that picked was a three, then the Mad Hatter is gonna say the random number was three. Else I move down the program. The next check is if the random number was two. If that's true, the Mad Hatter will say the random number was two and on down the list. So you can see how you could create not just a binary expression of if else, where it's sort of, it will either do this or this. You can use other nested constructs to create multiple more outcomes and continue on as much as you would like. That is the end of the one on the conditional block. Any questions on that? All right, then I'm gonna do one last one and we're gonna get into the tutorial that just says, if you weren't following when I spoke about relational expressions in the previous lessons, then let's talk a little bit about relational expressions, what that means and why it's useful in Alice. It's really just a way to compare entities to resolve to a true or false. So it can be used to replace the Boolean data type. Again, that is just, is this true or false? Um, definitely as we showed, used a lot to make if else conditions and while conditions so that there is something that is being resolved to find out whether it is true or false. The basics are just the equal to, not equal to, less than, greater than examples. We have done some other ones inside of Alice where you can do text comparisons. Um, the text comparisons can do starts with, contains. So if you're gonna do something where somebody inputs some text, 
make sure that you know if you make it equals equals they better write exactly what you wanted so contains and things like that can be good ways to make it a little bit broader in this anytime you have a, a boolean expression or a boolean data type relational will show up at the bottom and so you see the different types so the data types are first so decimal numbers whole numbers things so what do i want to compare to see if they are the same uh, or, or relative to each other uh, again we'll revisit variables later but you can use a variable to say is this decimal less than one those types of things so uh, both sides of your relational expression has have a little carrot that allows you to substitute and change them in uh, and those can be replaced with functions. They can repl be replaced with variables. It doesn't have to be just one um, step in this. So in this example, you see while both the decimal variable is less than and the decimal variable is greater than or equal to this other one, um, obviously that can't be resolved, but uh, you can continue to use the caret to drag down and add yet more conditions to uh, if you have something that is more complex. So maybe when the time is greater than zero and the score is greater than is how you win the game or something like that. So again, some quick common uses would be if the score is greater than 10, you win, otherwise you lost. So at the end of your program, you would resolve that and see which one is true. Uh, you can do quiz games, things like that. So I can get a string from a user and say, is a bear a mammal? And if their answer contains a yes, then they are right. If they put in something no or other, then it would be the wrong answer. Um, key presses are definitely ones where you're going to use these to just compare what key was pressed with a specific key to have outcomes. And then same thing on the models. We're using those relational expressions to say, is it equal to this? So you're comparing the data that's returned from the function with the one that I want to be true before I would execute something. All right, any questions there? Is the, can you set up a, a database for answers? Yeah, so the most common way in Alice to do that is we have the arrays and you can create a variable that is an array. And so in that way, you sort of create that data set. So the example of a bunch of different things that a character could say is, I would make an array of four different things like, hello, how are you? Those types of things, each one will have an array indices. So one or zero, one, two, three. Um, and then I can choose from that based on an outcome where I can random number choose from you know, zero to four to access that array. So really, we don't allow the user to set up external data bases and things like that. It's something that you know, we might do in the future, but for now, the best way to create those is either have variables and specifically uh, a variable that is an array so it can have multiple different um, pieces of data of the same data type. Make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, so let's go to our tutorial. So going back to the introduction to events, at the bottom of that screen, you'll see this one here. So this is going to cover a bunch of the things we just talked to today and make use of them. If it's going to let me click through to it. There we go. Not sure why that link wasn't working. I will check on that later. All right, so the introduction to the event. You see the little picture, we've got the ostrich and we've got the baby ostrich and it says, you found me. So the basic gist of what we're gonna do today is we're gonna create a very simplistic lost and found game. Um, this one I haven't updated to do all of the world maps and um, things that we want you to do for a design. So I apologize for that, but we will get to that eventually. And we would like you to do that in terms of listing it out and writing it and things like that. So we are going to go through this. We'll open up Alice. First question you have to ask yourself is where you want this game of lost and found to happen. You could do things on the seafloor and things like that. 
for just simplicity of seeing, I'm just gonna do a grass. Uh, as with everything, save first. So it will start to capture incremental saves on you in case something goes awry. Come over to the setup scene. Add a camera marker. So I'm going to add camera marker. Starting camera. Facing starting camera. All right, so I have a starting camera. This is where my game of lost and found is going to go down. So now we have that one set up. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to create that third person camera. Um, well, first we'll show you this part. So if I go to the code editor and I go to initialize event listeners, we see we have the my first method. We're going to do the add keyboard, add object, move for, and we're going to add it to the camera. So if I do this one, when I press run on this program, if I start using the arrow keys, you see that I move around. And so voila, you have created an interactive world in Alice with just that one little bit of code. Um, we want to do a third person camera for this one just because it's a little bit cooler. So going back to the setup scene, if you want to choose whatever character you want to do, it could be a bird, it could be a person, it could be any number of things. Um, today I am going to choose, we'll do a lioness. So I'm going to add the lioness in front of the camera. By default, the lioness is sort of staring at me because it adds to the scene facing the camera. Um, we don't want that to necessarily happen because it'd be weird for the camera to be following around the front of the lioness. So I'm going to use a one shot here, procedure, turn, doesn't matter which direction, I'm gonna go a half turn. Now we see that you know we're looking at sort of the back of the lioness. This is more traditional third person camera view. I am then going to go to the camera and now we see the camera vehicle. So we talked a little bit about that. change this to the lioness. So now the camera is riding on the lioness. Uh, I will run my program again, just to sort of show the point that the camera would ride the lioness. If the lioness moved, the camera would move, but it's not inverse in that if the camera moved, the lioness doesn't move because the lioness is not in the car that is the camera. Uh, the camera is in the car that is the lioness. Uh, so the next thing we would do is we go back to our code and we change this from camera to lioness. Now if I run my world, the arrow keys are moving the lioness and the camera is following it around. So you see how that sort of vehicling works for the first person or the third person camera. All right, so again to do that one, we've done add an object move for the lioness. In the scene editor side, we have set up the vehicling the camera to the lioness and that gets us that one. The other part that I skipped from the beginning is this is our character that is going to go in search of another object. Uh, we need to have something for the lioness to search for. So I'm gonna put a jaguar out here. If we were taking a little bit more time with this program, you would do sort of a world map that would be a top-down view or something like that that allows you to set up the world and hide your object to it. Um, What we are missing here is probably something to hide it because pretty much my program can just start and I can see the Jaguar and we are done. I'm gonna go grab a tree, we'll put the tree between us. All right, hidden. Now we've sort of got a game. If I press run, I can walk the lioness around in my complicated world and then voila, find the Jaguar. So there you go. But there's really no feedback to say or prove that I have found the Jaguar at this point. So now we're gonna get into using some event handlers and listeners. What we're gonna have you do for this next part is create a found procedure. 
uh, if you haven't done a custom procedure, uh, we can circle back on this and I'll tell you where to do it. But we're gonna do a scene procedure and we are gonna do scene, add scene procedure, and we're gonna call it found. So now we have this code. So what do we wanna have happen when the lioness finds the jaguar? We're gonna have the jaguar say that you found me. So we're going to the jaguar dropdown of the objects and then we're gonna grab jaguar say. Again, the hello would be the default custom text string. We're gonna go, you found me. All right, so now we have this code, but it's not being called. We want it to happen when we find the Jaguar. There's a number of different ways we're gonna do it. In this case, we're gonna use it for the mouse. So add mouse, click on object listener. And we are going to go back to our scene procedure. You see that we've got this found. So if I drag found into the mouse click, now if I run my program, we're gonna have the lioness run around. We can't find the jaguar, where's the jaguar? Now we see the jaguar, I can click on the jaguar, and the jaguar says you found me. Uh, pretty cool game, there's a suspense in finding it, proving you found it. Uh, but I'm gonna sort of pull back the curtain and say that really if I restart my program, I can click on the tree and the Jaguar will say you found me because we've really made it at this point so that the mouse click event is clicking on any object is gonna call found. We wanna use the details to make it so that it will only work for the Jaguar. So this goes back to, we talked about this in the parameters of our, um, event listeners, we have multiple event policy and we have this set of visuals. So if I select set of visuals and custom array, I can add any objects that I want this code, this event listener to uh, return a success for. In this case, we're gonna set it for the Jaguar, only the Jaguar. Now if I run my program and I click on the tree, you'll see nothing's happening. Don't take my word for it that I'm clicking. But if I run around the tree, till I can see the Jaguar. Now I can click on the Jaguar and the Jaguar will say you found me. The next one we're gonna do is, let's say that you actually took the time and by all means go back and create a much richer world where it's harder to navigate and it's harder to find something, in which case it becomes a little bit more difficult and maybe you wanna put a hint into your game to help the user find something. So in this case, we're gonna create something that is called the call and response. So let's say, the game, you know, Marco Polo, if I call out, you know, where are you? If this is a game, maybe the hint, maybe it's a hint. If this is just an interactive world where we're playing as a lioness and we really have to find the jaguar, then it's more a matter of just helping the narrative along. So we do the call and response. So where are you? I'm over here. We are gonna create another custom procedure. So I guess just pausing for a moment, if you didn't understand how we did the custom procedures, you could just as easily build this code in this line right here. So instead of using the found custom procedure, I could have just put the Jaguar says you found me code right here. Again, it will function, it will function the same way. The, the one downside is just that at a certain point, if you build all of your outcome code inside the listener here, this page will become very long it will become harder to really group them and see what types of listeners you're using and then separate out. If I wanted to change the found code or I use it in multiple different places, again, abstraction says that I can come here and the Jaguar could jump up and down. I could change what the Jaguar says. And if there's multiple different outcomes for found, things like that, I have more flexibility. But you could just put the Jaguar says found here. We are again gonna do another custom procedure. So if that is not something that you're comfortable with, again, you could write the code inside the event listener that we're going to do. So bear with me on this one. I am going to create another scene, add scene procedure. Remember, you can also go to the scene one and add a scene procedure here. So there's another way to do it. I'm gonna call it call and fonts. So now I have this call and response. What I wanted to do is have the lioness say custom string, are you? 
And if the lioness says, where are you? The jaguar will respond. I'm over here. And again, we now have this code, but we don't have any way for it to be called. So since my first method gets called, nothing happens there. We're not using the code anywhere we've written it, but it won't interact in the world. Let's say that we want to add it to a key press. So anytime I press the key, it will do that. Um, so keyboard, add key press listener. And then we are going to go back to the, we built it on scene. So remember from the object dropdown, if I want to get to the custom procedure that I wrote that was on the scene class, and I will drag the call and response. Again, if you don't know how to do this call and response, just set up this scene procedure. Let's start here drag in a key press listener and write into here instead of this, have the lioness say, where are you? And the jaguar say, I'm over here. We can now run this code. And we have done a generic key press. So any key on your keyboard, I can hit the H, J, K, things like that. And it's going to run it. So see how that works. Um, the trick there is that since we're using the arrow keys to walk around, every time I hit an arrow key, it triggers that arrow key press listener. So not something that we want to do. How do we make that more specific? Well, this goes into why we talked about the functions. There is the ability to add a conditional to this so that it only works for one key. Going down here, we have our if control block. So again, bottom of the code editor, if control block, if I drag that up into the key press listener, again, it forces me to choose a default. So true or false, I'm selecting true. We have this function built in here. And again, now we're seeing it in real time. When I roll one over, it'll tell you which ones can be put where. So this event is key, essentially is doing that relational expression of saying, is the key that was pressed this key equal to this key? If you built it yourself, you would have to first use the little caret drop down to do the relational equals equals, and I can build it, or I can use the one that is sort of built in to make it even easier for you. Drag this over here. So if the event is key, I have to tell it which key I care about. You see all the different options for A to Z, zero to nine, other arrow keys. I'm gonna use custom key just to show you how to do a space bar. It will pull up this little window. If I press the space bar, it is now pressing the key as the space bar and hit OK. So if the event is the key space, so essentially, if what is the key? Does it equal the space bar? If so, we're going to do this part here. Otherwise, we're going to do nothing if I leave the else empty. So here, now we've constructed a, an addition to that key press that limits what's going to happen. If I run my program, now I can run around using the arrow keys and I'm not yelling all over the place, where are you? I can press other keys on the keyboard and nothing will happen. But if I hit the space bar, we'll get the where are you? So now we have something where we've sort of only used one key on the keyboard to do a very specific thing. Um, so that is very useful. I'm gonna show you next the how to use a parameter. So again, if you haven't covered parameters or uncomfortable with parameters, uh, this part might be a little bit overboard, but we will go through it. Um, going back to the example, so we have this add details. The one option that you have is this get model at mouse location. It's going to return a thing object. If we wanted to do something where first, let's say, now we have multiple characters to find in the world. Um, go back and add somebody else. So there's a lost jaguar, there's a lost hyena. We'll just put the hyena over here for a second. I am challenged with finding all of them. Uh, I can do something here where in my found code, I'm gonna add a parameter. It's gonna be the found character. I think here, I don't remember what I asked you in your tutorial to do it. Uh, found character, we are going to say that it is a value type of gallery class. We are going to choose 
uh, as thing, which would allow me to return any of them. I think this will work. I might have to set it as a different type. I'm going to understand that now I am creating a required parameter on something that's already been used. So now we have the found character. Oh, nope. I'm going to delete that one. Add parameter gallery class as model. Now I can replace it. The reason that I couldn't use the data type S thing is that the ground and sky and things like that can't talk. We don't have the ability to add a say statement. So we created this S model. So now if I go back to my event code, we'll see that there's this red one. Um, I can add the get model and mouse location. So what we've done now is we're using this function to say when I click on an object, which object was clicked because I want to know that we're passing it as a parameter into this found, which allows us to access it here. And now whoever is found is going to do this. The next addition we're going to do is, well, the only person that we can click on right now is the Jaguar. So we want to edit that. And so we're going to do custom array. There's the Jaguar. We're now going to add the hyena. So now the way this is constructed, the mouse click on object listener will only return if you click on either the Jaguar or the hyena. We're using the function for the get model at mouse location as a parameter into our found um, procedure that then shows up up here. And we're gonna drag that found character in to replace instead of it having being the Jaguar say you found me, it's gonna be whichever character you clicked on. Now when we run our program, I can click on the hyena or I can keep looking and find the elusive Jaguar I want to click on the Jaguar. So now that we can see them both, we get a different outcome depending on who we click on and who talks and things like that. So this is a bunch of different ways that you can modify and use the parameters. Um, the most important part of what we covered today was just these different constructs. So we've shown you how to use a mouse click, the default add object move for, how to use a conditional inside an arrow key press to contain it to just one space and things like that. I'll do a a simpler version of this really quickly. So let's say that we used no custom procedure parameter and we set this up as, you know, the Jaguar says custom sex training found me. I can also use this get model at mouse location here to replace the hyena. And so again, not using the whole more complicated, using a parameter to pass it in. I can do that here. And now when I run my program, it will still function the same way. It's just a little bit different in terms of how we've constructed the code um, to not use separated listeners and handlers, but it is still just as valid. It'll just make editing things a little bit different. All right. I'm gonna wrap this one up just real quick saying, thank you for joining us for this lesson um, or lessons. Um, join us next week for one that will be on a design. Now that we've covered all of those, we can do interactive worlds, interactive narratives, open worlds, using a bunch of the things we've talked about thus far. Um, so thank you for joining us this week.